this morning, uh, we've entitled the message, uh, Never Forget, Christmas Really Happened. When we see the phrase, never forget, it is used in conjunction with something that had a horrible outcome or had a great impact on someone's life. We use it for national tragedies and to bring awareness of an event and to remind people what happened with the idea that it will not happen again. As we get further and further away from the date that it occurred, the memories of what happened start to fade. Those directly affected always remember, but more and more people are born who have not experienced it and have no idea how it affected the world around them. This morning, I want to remind you to never forget Christmas really happened. We're going to turn over to John. We're going to spend most of the sermon uh, today, or all of the sermon, really, from the scriptures we find in John. In John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 4 says, In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Verse 12 says, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Christmas is about Jesus who came to this earth to be the light to all people so that we can, have all, we can all have the opportunity to become children of God. But this is not just a message for Christmas. It is a message that we need to remember and share all year. We need to proclaim him like John the Baptist In John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Never forget the idea of Christmas because Jesus came to the earth to be our Savior. There are people born every day that need to hear this message who do not know the impact that Jesus has on the world around them. This morning, I'd like to share a short video clip with you at this time. Imagine Christmas is over. All the programs have been performed. All the pictures have been taken. The carolers are done singing. The holiday parties have come and gone. The presents are unwrapped. And the big dinners have all been eaten. The Christmas music is turned off. The family's headed back home. Someone from work is on the phone. The kids have a practice to get to. The house needs to be cleaned. The bills still need to be paid. The groceries are running low. The stock market is still down and up and down. The TV is still on. The news is still worrisome. Life just keeps going as if Christmas never happened. But it did happen. Look around. The church is full of family and friends and laughter. Because the baby is still the Savior. And the Savior is still the gift held out to a world still looking for joy, an earth still waiting for peace, and the peaceful still sing in wonder. 
of the God who gave his Son, and the Son who gave his life, to add us to his family, and one day welcome us home. Imagine Christmas is over, but remember that it really happened, and it changed everything. After all the festivities that the holiday brings, there is a welcome time of rest and relaxation as our life gets back to being normal again. Soon after, we settle back into our routines and we put the idea of Christmas to the back of our minds. We start to go about our lives unchanged by the idea of who Jesus is and what he came to do. Or we don't allow our, li- our changed lives to be seen by the world around us, and we forget that we need to continue to share the idea of Christmas and how it can change their lives. We simply start to forget about how God's love has impacted our life, and that we need to invite people to come and see who Jesus is throughout the year, just not at Christmas. This morning, I want to use the book of John as we look at four things concerning Jesus and this idea of Christmas that we should never forget. The first one is never forget who he is. The purpose of the book of John is to show us who Jesus is. John chapter 20, verses 30 through 31 say, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. This in itself is an extensive topic to cover. But I want to just talk about a few of these things this morning to show a common thread that we have throughout all of them. The first one is Jesus is the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse 35, Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. As humans, when we get hungry or thirsty, We want to satisfy that craving that we have by eating something or drinking something. But hours later, the craving comes back again, and we have to continually satisfy that craving. But Jesus is saying that he can give something that can satisfy our hunger and thirst that we have. It is not a physical hunger and thirst, but a hunger and thirst in our soul that wants to know who we are and what our purpose is. These are answers that can only be satisfied from the words of God. By being our bread of life, Jesus is providing that which is essential for our spiritual life. He's also the light of the world. John chapter 8 verse 12, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Light is an important part for our physical life. Plants need light to live. So as they grow, they are drawn to the light. We also need light so that we can see where we're going. And we use lights as beacons to warn people of pending danger. But the problem is that we don't always know what needs to be illuminated. Even with our own light, we can still find ourselves in circumstances that are troubling. Jesus is saying the light that we have or that he provides to the world will keep you out of spiritual darkness, not a physical darkness. A light that exposes the evil of the world and provides a beacon by which we can trust our spiritual lives with. By being our light, Jesus provides a life for our spiritual lives to grow. And as we grow, we will be drawn to his light. Jesus also says he's the door or the gate John chapter 10, verse 7. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. We use doors and gates to give ourselves protection 
and to allow only people that we know to come and go. There are many people that claim that there is more than one door to life, and we can choose whichever one makes us feel the best. By being the door, Jesus is the only way through which we can be saved. As the door, he provides protection for our spiritual lives from Satan and those that are there that claim that they are the way. He says he's the good shepherd. John chapter 10, verse 14. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. As humans, we like to be cared for and know that someone has our best interest in mind. But when the hard times come and we look around, there may be no one there for help. By being our good shepherd, Jesus would do anything to keep us safe to the point that he laid down his life for us. We can take comfort that Jesus knows us and will provide for our needs as a sheep of his flock. As our shepherd, Jesus will never forsake us, no matter what circumstances come that threaten his flock. Jesus also says he's the resurrection and the life. John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? There's a fascination with what happens after we die. We have people that say they can communicate with those that have died to deliver their messages to those that are still living. There is finality with physical death and the separation that it has from life here on earth. And people want an an assurance for what is inevitably to come for all of us. By being the resurrection and the life, Jesus is stating that he has the power over death. Even though it is not a physical resurrection for us, it still provides a hope that we will live spiritually with God in a perfect place if we believe in who he is. Through this, Jesus provides hope and gives us comfort, just as it did Mary here in these verses, when we have a separation by death. He says he's the way, the truth, and the life. John chapter 14, verse 6, it says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. We are, when we are faced with a decision in our life, we want to make sure that we choose the right path. We try to figure out which information is true in order to make the most out of our life in each decision that we make. The world tells us that we should define our own truth that works for us. But by being the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus is distinguishing that he himself is the only path, the only true source of truth, and the provider of life away from the bondage of sin. Any other way, any other source of truth does not provide the life we should desire away from sin. He says, I am the vine. John chapter 15, verse 5. I'm the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. In our lives, we cannot survive on our own. We rely on people around us for encouragement and advice. But even as we try to help each other, there is something that is missing to help sustain our lives. By being the vine, Jesus provides a way for a connected personal relationship in our spiritual lives to him. Knowing as long as we stay connected to him through prayer, the studying of his word, and obeying his commands, our lives will reflect Jesus. You see, in all these descriptions that we have of who Jesus is, each one has a common thread woven throughout. He is our Savior. And every aspect of who Jesus is describes the one who was born to be the Savior of the world. When we know who Jesus is, it is easier to never forget what he came to do. Jesus came to do the will of the Father. 
John chapter 6, verses 38 through 40. It says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he has given to me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. The will of the Father was to show the world who God is so that they may believe that Jesus is the Son of God. As we read through scriptures, it may seem like it was easy for Jesus to do the will of the Father, but we can get a glimpse of the struggles in two places. The first was that when Jesus was tempted by Satan, and the second was when Jesus was praying in the garden before he was crucified. Both times angels were sent to minister to Jesus and to strengthen him. There is a struggle that happens when we do the will of God and not our own. Jesus came to show us that it can be done and it is worth it to the very end of our life. But he also came to be a servant. John chapter 13, verses 3 through 5. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured a water. He poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Jesus knew that he had the power over everything. After all, he is the creator. But Jesus chose to show us how to love people by serving them. He took on the lowest position there in the upper room, a job that the disciples should have done, and and he used it to teach them a lesson. It continues in verse 14, saying, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Our world tells us that there is a greatness that needs to be obtained to be successful. But Jesus says that you will be blessed by just serving one another. He also came to give glory to God. John chapter 17, verses 4 through 5. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Everything that Jesus did pointed people to God. From the miracle at the wedding feast the healing of the lame man, restoring the sight of the blind man, healing the sick and diseased, all the way to raising Lazarus from the dead, pointed people to believe in him, to believe in God. It is easy to get caught up in all the things that you can do that are great and lose sight of what it is all for. Jesus did many great things that drew multitudes of people to him, but used each opportunity to teach and to point them to God. Even though he knew not all the people would continue to like him or even believe in him. And lastly, he came to give up his life. John chapter 12, verse 27. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No. It was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus, in predicting his death to the people, knew that this was the reason why he came. It was Jesus' death that would save us, and even though it caused his soul to be troubled, he finished what he came to do, to die the most horrifying death imaginable to mankind because of people like you and me. So when you understand what he came to do, We will never forget God's love for us. Through everything that Jesus did here on earth, we can see the love that God had for us. Even though we have the choice whether or not to follow him, 
God still loved us and sent his son to give us the opportunity to choose eternal life with him. John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his, his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God wants to restore that perfect relationship with him that he had with Adam and Eve in the garden before sin. But that restoration came at a cost, the sacrifice of his one and only son. Our life should be changed to reflect the joy that comes from the love that God showed us through his son, Jesus. And when we remember how God's love has changed our life, we should never forget to tell people to come and see. When we reflect on where we were before our belief in Jesus, and we see where we are now when we have chosen to believe in him and follow him, it should get us excited to bring others to Jesus. In John chapter 1, we have an example here of Andrew. And in verse 40, it says, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two that heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. It says the first thing that Andrew did when he started to follow Jesus was to find his brother. Andrew was not the only disciple to go and get his brother. So did Philip. And in verse 43, it says, The next day Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, Philip, said Philip. You see, Nathanael asks a question about Jesus. And we see here that Philip tells him to come and see. Philip wanted Nathanael to come and see and to get his questions answered for himself. It seems that when we first come to know that Jesus is our Savior, and when we begin our walk with him, that is the time we get the most excited to go and share with others. Then we allow life to stifle that joy, and we become more reserved because we have forgotten, forgotten where that joy came from. We can't forget the impact that the woman at the well had when she met Jesus as well. This was a woman who allowed life to define who she was. She came alone to draw water at a time when she knew no one would be there. And that is where she met Jesus. Jesus, within their conversation, reveals to her that he is the Messiah by telling the woman things about her life that she had done. Jesus knew her problems, but still shared with her the message that he was proclaiming. And because Jesus took the time <clears throat> to talk with her, she gets excited about the message. And we read here in John chapter 4, starting with verse 28, she says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. Jesus saw the people coming, and the opportunity that the woman had brought to him and the disciples to be able to teach them about who Jesus was. Jesus tells his disciples here in verse 34 or 35, it says, don't you, have, don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Jesus saw the people coming and saw that the fields were ripe for harvest. 
No matter where we are or who we are talking to, take the time to tell them the message of Jesus. You never know what will happen to the person that hears about Jesus. Because the woman at the well went and shared the message and not only impacted the ones that came back with her to the well, but her entire community. The next few verses here in John chapter 4, we see the outcome from the woman at the well telling people to come and see. Verse 39 says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, We no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. Our life should be a testimony to others. Our words should be a testimony to others to come and see, to be able to learn and believe in what Jesus can do for their lives. We don't want them to believe just by what we say, but because they see for themselves what Jesus has done for them. We want them to come and see the Savior of the world. We want them to experience the joy that comes from a life that is lived from a changed heart. And so this morning, as we bring this message to a close, my prayer this morning is that you will never forget that Christmas really happened. Jesus was sent to this world and lived in this world. And no matter how far we are from the season, you need to share the message of Jesus who came to be the Savior of the world. Don't let life rob you of the joy of remembering who Jesus is because he came to be an example of how you should live. Not only to be an example, but to be, our, to be your savior, to save you from, the wanting, from wanting the ways of this dark world. He came because God loves you and wants a personal relationship with you. But you have to tell people to come and see the one who changed your life. So I pray this morning that you never forget. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time that we can come together, that we can hear and listen to the message from your word. And Lord, I pray that we never forget the idea of Christmas and that you came to this world to be the Savior of the world. And Lord, I pray that the excitement that we have, Lord, as we live our life, our changed life because of you, that we can be a testimony to the world around us that invites them to come and see the change that has happened in our life and to know that Jesus can do the same for theirs. And Lord, I pray for each and every one that is here this morning. I pray that we can uplift and encourage each other to live the life that we need to so that we can be the example we need to everyone around us. We just thank you and praise you for your son and for the hope that it gives that we can be in perfect communion with you again. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.